uh, uh, going uh, across on the x-axis and on the y-axis from bottom to top, you've got the stock in quantity. So again, you can see that for some SKUs, you want to carry more stock. For other SKUs, you want to carry less stock, uh, depending on the demand trends and things of that sort. Uh, but uh, invariably, what tends to happen there is that you carry too much inventory of stock that you don't need, and you do not carry enough inventory of products that you should be carrying more of. Uh, so again, uh, that, in essence, captures the need for inventory management. And uh, that essentially is what, uh, what, what most of us in supply chain deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So why does this happen? Well, a simple answer to that is most times we tend to treat all SKUs and all customers the very same. There's no differentiation that we make between SKUs or customers unless we are contractually obligated to make that uh, uh, distinction. Uh, where does the advantage lie? Yeah, we've, we've got this non-differentiation of customers and SKUs that comes into play. Well, it really comes into play with managing the tail, the very end of uh, the SKU base or the customer base. So let me... Let me talk through this with, uh, with some examples. Uh, this is from a recent project. Uh, to the left on your screens, uh, you see the SKU demand Pareto, and to the right, you actually see the customer demand Pareto. Uh, what that basically means is, uh, typically, from a classic Pareto perspective, 80% of your volume would come from 20% of your stakeholders. So if it's SKUs, 80% of your volume typically would come from 20% of your SKU base. And from a customer demand perspective, 80% uh, of your volume typically should come from 20% of your customers. In this case, uh, we'll start to, uh, when, when you start looking at uh, the numbers, you very quickly start to see that 85% of the demand is made up by 29% of the SKUs. And uh, similarly, on the customer side, 85% of the demand is, again, made up by 29% of the customers. Uh, this is just happenstance, but uh, typically you would see the numbers to be fairly close, unless you are driven by, uh, by, by customers such as Walmart, which basically form 80% of your volume, things of that sort. The customer profiles uh, shouldn't change very drastically from your SKU profiles. Um, or if, if that Pareto is turned around and put inversely, what you can start to see is the tail effect that comes into play. The anatomy of the tail is seen very clearly. And uh, essentially what we are doing here is we are just using the basic ABC uh, Pareto curve uh, to do the analysis. So again, a very rudimentary technique. but. Uh, that's essentially what we're trying to use here to uh, illustrate some of the opportunities with regards to inventory management. Um, so again, what does uh, the long tail do for SKUs? And I'm going to pick up SKUs, and you can uh, extrapolate that to customers. You can extrapolate that to forecasting. You can extrapolate that to demand planning. You can uh, Any of these supply chain functions uh, and stakeholders can essentially uh, uh, appreciate the anatomy of the tail very quickly. Now, uh, if I was to break out the, t uh, the, the anatomy of the skew base into two portions, you've got the green, which is it's good, it's healthy, versus the yellow, which is somewhat questionable uh, with regards to uh, my supply chain efficiencies. Uh, healthy basically means it allows for uh, me to gain a lot of, uh, well, it, it generates a revenue stream, a uh, healthy to revenue stream. It is also somewhat consistent in band, uh, hopefully, because it forms a lion's share of the revenues. If you start looking at the tail end of uh, the SKU base, you've got SKUs that do not contribute much to uh, the revenue stream. They also are somewhat lumpy in demand, uh, which means you essentially have difficulty in forecasting those demand trends. Uh, and overall, that is what starts to affect supply chain efficiencies, because that leads to issues with uh, 
you know, optimizing stock. How much safety stock do I carry? Well, it's, it's lumpy, so I really don't know. Uh, it also deals with uh, in-season versus out-of-season. Uh, so there, there are multiple things that start to come into play, and the entire, uh, uh, entire tale starts to affect stockouts. It can also affect your manufacturing strategies because uh, of the slow volumes, uh, you want to, if you're in the business of optimizing production runs, uh, you probably do not want or you do not have an incentive to produce the slow-moving SKUs. So essentially what it's starting to do is affect the entire cost to serve uh, picture, and that's, uh, that, that becomes somewhat critical when we start talking about supply chain efficiencies and inventory management techniques. So I'll come back to the case study, and uh, what we'll do is we'll start concentrating on 90% of the demand. So uh, about 36% of the SKUs form 90% of the demand, and 36% of, or 34% of the customers form 90% of the demand. So again, I'll call the 36% of the SKUs as power SKUs because they really tend to have the gravity to, uh, to define my revenue stream. And I'm also defining 34% of my customers as power customers since they tend to drive the revenue stream as well. Um, so very quickly, if I was to put this in a cross chart, uh, what you start to see is pockets of activity. Uh, you basically see the, the, you've got power SKUs at the top for customers and non-power SKUs with regards to the tail. And then you've got power SKUs for SKUs uh, from top to bottom. Uh, on the screen, and then non-power SKUs uh, towards the bottom of uh, the uh, uh, y-axis. Now again, the green there is shows you the healthy mix. It's the power SKUs and the power customers. Diagonally opposite to that are the non-power SKUs and non-power customers. You can see right there the uh, size of, and this is again drawn to scale, the size of the non-power SKUs and non-power customers that starts to come, in, come to bear. Uh, I'll take this a little further, and I'm going to start working with percentages. So if this gets to be somewhat mathematical, uh, I certainly apologize, but you'll have to believe me on the numbers. Uh, essentially, what we are saying is, if I use 36% of my power of my SKUs, which are the power SKUs, and I'm going to concentrate on the top left uh, of this graphic for a minute. So I've got 36% of my SKUs as power SKUs, and I've got 34% of my customers as power customers. Uh, overall, when I look at the skew customer combinations, you know, the unique combinations that come together, I'm looking at 12.25% of the skew customer weight, or the skew customer combinations. However, we had 90% of the volume in customers and 90% of the volume in SKUs coming from those two categories uh, of power SKUs and power customers. Effectively, if you are selling each SKU to each customer and each customer is equally likely to buy each SKU, you're looking at 80%, 81% of your volume just coming for, from 12.35% of your SKU base. Now again, you've got the two uh, portions of this graphic that are in yellow, and you can start to see very quickly how the non-power SKUs with power customers and power SKUs with non-power customers comprise almost an equal amount in terms of volume. They're both 9%. However, uh, your customers tend to be more complex to manage, and I'm saying that the easiest way to relate to that is from the size of uh, the, 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 the yellow uh, graphics uh, that are shown pictorially. The most important thing from this graphic here, though, is to realize the portion that is covered in amber uh, color, and that is just 1% of the total volume. So you've covered 81% in the green. You've covered 2 times 9 
in the yellow, which is 18, so you covered 99% of your volume right there. You've got the remaining 1% of your volume, but that is coming from almost 43% of your SKU customer weight. Now, to get 1% of your volume to be doing 43% of the effort, uh, at least I would say, is too much effort for too little value. And that is where we see an opportunity for improving efficiencies without getting into uh, technology, without getting into high-end tools, uh, but using simple data analytics techniques. Uh, so again, uh, very quickly, how does this uh, start to affect the inventory par management paradigm? So again, we've got uh, the greens, the yellows, and uh, the, the amber. Uh, what you start to see is a different definition. I'm not, start, I'm not defining them as A's, B's, or C's anymore. I'm defining them as type 1 SKUs, type 2A and 2B SKUs, and then type 3 SKUs. Uh, the opportunity is in the type 3 SKUs. Uh, the type 1 SKUs are essentially uh, the, the cash cow for any company. Uh, so essentially, that should be a make-to-stock item. Type 3, I would argue, could potentially be a make-to-order item or an item that potentially has a longer forecast horizon or a longer make horizon. Uh, it also ties into, uh, for us at least, when we start talking about uh, these, the, the entire paradigm, is I, I should ideally never be wrong with regards to my forecast accuracy and my forecast bias uh, on my Type 1 SKUs now. Of course, that's a dream come true for most of us. We start talking about, uh, start talking about uh, uh, having a perfect forecast, but uh, hopefully a less than 10% forecast. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm relating this to uh, CPG companies now. Uh, those forecasting uh, uh, benchmark indices tend to be very different uh, for uh, different companies and different industry verticals. But for CPG, I would hope that uh, we could uh, focus at about 10%. Uh, with regards to type 2s, uh, or especially the type 2A, uh, which is the power SKU, you're still dealing with the power SKU. Uh, you could go to about 40%, but you've started making a distinction between your power customers and your non-power customers. It gets into order allocation as well and prioritization of orders. You want to deal with uh, the the... Uh, power customers before you deal with non-power customers because they're important. Uh, uh, you don't want to offend them. Uh, and then uh, you also start dealing with differentiated service levels. Uh, you potentially want to hire, or you potentially want to provide a higher service level for uh, SKUs that are power SKUs and go to power customers. On the other hand, alternatively, uh, you probably want to provide a lower service level to SKUs that fall in the amber category, the type 3 categories. Uh, with regards to your supply chain policies, uh, you never want to be out of your power SKUs. You always want to have them on hand. With regards to your non-power SKUs, uh, you could beg a little forgiveness. Uh, you could potentially have allocation-based programs that come into play. Uh, you have uh, uh, centralization of slow movers and then providing of uh, the slow movers uh, through, uh, through, through efficient transportation means. That's where uh, transportation trade-off with regards to inventory comes into play. Uh, you also have uh, different supply chain policies for different customers that can come into play. When you're talking about power SKUs and power customers, uh, you probably want to do full truckloads to their DCs. Yeah, so again, that's a different strategy from replenishing from a DC, but you're now dealing only with pallets, which is what you want to do with uh, type 2As. Uh, or you want to only handle layers at, at best. You don't want to go down to a case level. and You definitely don't want to go down to an each pick level. And again, uh, talking about uh, you know, from, from a CPG perspective, uh, uh, shipping out to uh, retailers, big box retailers. Uh, so again, there are multiple things that start to come into play when you start looking at the inventory manufacturing paradigm. You could actually start affecting your manufacturing and procurement strategies as well. With your power SKUs, you want to start uh, to 
manufacture them uh, 